Hey everybody, Psalm 27 is a detailed description of how we can invite God to protect us and what he can protect us from. It's like an extraction. God is going to jump out of a helicopter and grab us out of somewhere. Pairing it with this, the grotesque image of eating the flesh. This is spiritual war. The good news is though, God is good at spiritual war. Yes, I did draw the Lord as a giant octopus. The psalm starts talking about how God is our protection, which is a nice thought, but there, there are particular aspects to the way that God protects us. Verse one, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Was there a song? Somebody made those into song lyrics. I have a tune playing in my head. You know, do you not know that? You don't listen to religious music? Oh, okay. The Lord is my, we got a couple of elements here. The Lord's a light, salvation. You could just say, Lord's, Lord's got it all taken care of. Why are we breaking it into these pieces? The Lord whole is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And also, have a question, like this is a good question, of whom shall I be afraid? Who does God protect us from? Is it protecting us from our rivals? Is it protecting us from, our, you know, if, if we've just stolen something from someone and they're chasing us, is God gonna protect us from them? What are we talking about? How can you be so confident that God is gonna always be your stronghold? Let's take a look at what each of these elements mean. In summary, we have created these little uh, syntheses of what Swedenborg's commentary is on these verses, of what the inner sense of these verses is. In general, this is talking about how we don't have to fear the attacks of hell. Hell is the attacker in all of this. That is, what, that is who you really want to be protected from. Sure, it'd be great to be protected from humiliation or from, some, you know, someone's trying to sue you or something, yeah. But the real stuff you don't want to have happen is hell coming at you. Or that will be destroyed by hellish negativity. What does it mean when hell's coming at you? They are trying to get you to live the same kind of hell. They're trying to get us to live in this uh, anti-goodness and truth, anti-the Lord lifestyle. So why don't we need to be scared of that? Hell sounds fairly intimidating. What does God got in his pocket that can help us out. Well, here we see that God is the light, and light is a classic correspondence for truth, that God will lead us to guiding truth, that God is the way, you know, the lamp to the feet, the way in which we're going to know how to plot a human life that can lead to the life of heaven, truth and happiness, and away from the little traps and eddies that hellish negativity will try to get you into. So God is going to show you, mm, you don't need to go there. You don't need to dive into those thoughts and feelings. You don't need to try to pursue that. You don't need to worry about that. This is the way to go. Also, God is salvation and stronghold. Isn't that just repetition? What's the difference? Well, in salvation is the one who rescues us from hellish thoughts and feelings. You ever been there? When you just feel like, oh, I'm just in this hell. When you're already there, the salvation is God reaching in. And, and there's, there's definitely been times where I just feel like, I, I don't know what to do. And you sort of forget that you can ask for divine help, that, that God is and that God exists. But when you get that remembering and you say, okay, you know, you, you, what do I do? You've got this. Uh, I, I'm kind of out of options here. There's this amazing process that can take place where you suddenly feel like, oh, right. Never thought of it like that. Oh yeah, I don't need to. That is the salvation. And that's a miniature example. On a large scale, it's, it's the Lord pulling us out of everything in our life that's wrong with us. God sees us as we should be, right? As, as we're destined to be and can know, no, we gotta take this off and put this over here and rearrange this and we, we, you've got a lot of potential and I can get that out. But it happens in these little moments as well. The stronghold is the one who provides protection 
against spiritual attack. So this is when we, when we go to God as a stronghold, we wouldn't, this is when we can prevent ourselves from as often getting into this needing salvation in the first place. So this is, re, uh, I want to say reconnaissance, but that's not the word. It's like an extraction. God is going to jump out of the helicopter and grab us out of somewhere. This is where we're behind these strong walls. We just did this episode about Psalm 91, which is a lot of warfare imagery in there too. These are not battles between human beings. It's about the battle between uh, a good and evil inside of ourselves. And we talk more about it. Check out that episode if you want a little more about that, what kinds of attack we come under. Okay, and that's just verse one. Verses two to three are about how God is protecting us against spiritual enemies. When evildoers assail me, there's so much evildoers that the Bible is so broken into, well, there's me and there's all these evildoers that are trying to mess with me. But really, if, if you go and talk to somebody and they say, oh, well, the problem is this, I, I just always have these problems and it's because this person's doing this and this person's doing that. Every, all my coworkers are the problem. It's probably, you're probably part of the problem. So isn't that usually a sign that somebody lacks some self-awareness when they only blame other people? So why does it seem like the Bible is full of this, it's, it's black and white, there's people who are against me and then there's me. It's because this is not about the complex interplay of human beings where we're all usually like a little bit right and a little bit wrong. And this is about heaven and hell inside of us. These are spiritual enemies. And that's the one God is really interested in protecting us from. So let's look at that with that lens. When evildoers assail me, so this is some kind of spiritual enemy here. Evildoers assail me. To devour my flesh, yeah, that escalated quickly. So they're going to eat us. My adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. I bet we're going to come up and devour my flesh. What? Are you sure? Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. And again, this, like, you just said this, didactic pairing. You said the same thing twice. It's because of correspondences. Let's dig into what these verses mean. The adversaries, the foes, the army. Who is this? Which people? All the hellish feelings and thoughts that want to attack us. You ever had an army encamped against you in your heart or your mind? You ever felt like, I just am swirling down into this thing and it's just me against this unseen world. If, or you think about over the scope of your life, everything you're battling with and struggling with, that's when it feels like, okay, this is, I am one against many. The forces of hell, this is our synthesis, the forces of hell do feel hatred toward any good qualities in us and want to destroy us. So this is about the, who is the you in there, right? Because there's, okay, there's my, my bad side and my good side. The, the you, the real you, is these good qualities. And this is what all this negativity is trying to destroy. We get to Swedenborg's Apocalypse Revealed 748 for a little more illumination on this. This has to do with why are they going to eat the flesh? Why do we got to even go there? Because flesh symbolizes a person's inherent character. And people who hate others attack their personal character with the intention of destroying it. Therefore, to eat the flesh also has this symbolic meaning. I love, like, let's lift this right out of here. People who hate others attack their personal character with the intention of destroying it. That's something that I can, person to person, be watching out for. When Am I trying to attack someone's character? Not to stop them if they're doing something that's harming themselves or others, but am I trying to attack who they are with the intention of destroying it? Not the intention to reform or the intention to protect, but I'm trying to destroy their character. To pay, that doesn't always seem so obviously destructive and harmful, but it is, and so pairing it with this the grotesque image of eating the flesh, that was a wake-up call. Oh yeah, that to, to try to destroy someone, someone's character, is really bad. And since it's bad, that's what hell is doing to us all the time. That is what these negative thoughts and feelings are trying to do to the good things in us, destroy them. And 
again, if you're wondering about why all these wars, aren't we trying to get away from war? Didn't, didn't Jesus say, like, turn the other cheek? Wars in the word symbolize spiritual wars, which are attacks on truth and are waged by reasonings based on falsities. Because the truth is, you're going to be okay. And the truth is that life is good and that God knows what God is doing and that there is nothing that can't be brought to a good end. But that's not the way it seems. And there's all kinds of unhelpful thoughts and feelings that are coming at us, trying to destroy that sense of security. This is spiritual war. The good news is, though, God is good at spiritual war. We can have confidence in our hearts that the Lord is protecting us. That is what these verses are about. That's why when you're up here, it's saying, yeah, we've got this army. Yeah, we've got it. By the way, I don't know which is which, but always when there's two things together, one is about intellect and the other is about will. So one's talking about the attack on your heart. The other talking about the attack on your mind. Doesn't matter. We're confident. We're not afraid because... God can protect us from those. God is the light, the stronghold, and the, what's the other one? Salvation. <laughs> so, we got it. That's what this psalm is about, is about us un buying into that. Because that is what can protect, our belief in that is what protects. If you think that's how life really works, it takes the potency out of these ideas that are trying to scare you outside of this framework of God protecting us. Because you say, no, I know that. I'm going to be all right because, of course, that's how life works. Let's get into probably the most counterintuitive thing. Verses 4 to 6 are about how we have to want that protection. Who, who wouldn't want protection? Why would you have to want it? Why wouldn't you just get it? One thing I, have, I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. When I read that, I just get this sense of a little bit of a picture of some kind of old school stone temple -y house and this feeling of peace. Oh yeah, this is the house of the Lord. It's because we speak this language. That we get it. It's, it's not even the house of the Lord like a temple, but it's the house of the Lord like this state of mind God is trying to bring us into. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire into his temple. Doesn't sound so bad. We've got a, mu a markedly different tone here. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me. I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. So how do you get that? St what That life four to six life, I want that life. How do we get there? We move into that protection through a desire to live in the house of the Lord. Okay, sign me up. I'd love to trade in my house for the house of the Lord. I'm just, I'm sure it's a good retail investment. I mean, real estate investment. Dwelling in Jehovah's house stands for existing and living in the, what is the house of God? It's this, goodness that love inspires. Because a loving goodness is Jehovah's house. Okay. So you can dwell in the house of Jehovah. This is probably exactly how it looks. A loving goodness. So somehow we can find ourselves in living in a loving goodness. And when we do that, all these enemies and armies that were encamped your head is up above them. So how does that work? Well, Swedenborg has his famous lead into his book, Divine Love and Wisdom. Love is our life. What we love is our life. So how do you live in a loving goodness? You make that the primary thing that's driving your life. It's not that every th single thing you do is going to be obviously driven by loving goodness. But if you think, look, I want to wake, when I wake up today, what I, my intention, what I'm striving toward is to live out of a love for the welfare of the human race, a love for what is good and to do what is good, that that's my highest priority and desire. That's the house of Jehovah. And when we're in that state, 
the attacks that hell will try to lob at us, which are like, hey, aren't you afraid about your reputation or your possessions or something? And you can say, well, that's not, that's not really where I live. Well, well, sure, that stuff is great, and I'm glad that God is giving it to me, but my house is this house of Jehovah, and that that is going to take care of me. Because, as you read, when you're in the house of Jehovah, it's a great place. His temple, his shelter, his tent, all these things, different words to describe the house of Jehovah are a heavenly state of mind based on the goodness and truth from the Lord and a life according to it. Yeah, man, this like bright shining, I'm here. This kind of life, it's sitting there right in the middle of the day. Like I, I can just, yeah, this kind of stuff, there's unlimited access to being able to try to do good and live a good life. And to seek after and inquire, that we need to pursue that state of mind. So God can do the fighting. God can be the stronghold and the salvation and the light. But we have a part here. How do we help God do what God needs to do? We need to pursue that state of mind. We're going to get you to more about that in just a minute here. Set me high on a rock is teaching us heavenly truth. So if we're pursuing that state of mind, the loving goodness state of mind, that's the matrix in which God can implant heavenly truth. We can become, not just be in a temple, but become a temple by inviting the Lord's love and truth into our lives. And in case you're wondering, like, ah, oh, is it better to be in a tent close to nature? Is it better to be in a temple? Why are we talking about these different things? The reason why a tent in the word is taken to mean sacred, heavenly love is that the ancients carried out sacred worship in their tents. Ancients meaning people a long time ago. Yeah. When they started to profane the tents with profane types of worship, so for the uninitiated, Swedenborg describes a whole spiritual history where we, had it, we were doing really well as a human race with the love and the truth and the goodness, and we got corrupted by e egocentrism and materialism and greed and fell off that, but then we found a new way. God instilled a new sort of church. Was, uh, you know, we had left the stronghold, needed the salvation, God brought the light to the next phase, and we go kind of go up and down in these waves. The reason why a tent in the word is taken to mean sacred heavenly love is that the ancient carried out their sacred worship in tents. When they started to profane the tents with profane types of worship, the tabernacle and later the temple were built. So tents have the same symbolism as the tabernacle and the subsequent temple. It's just different iterations of it. A godly person, a godly person is therefore called a tent. How's it going, tent? Is that a title that you would aspire to have? Wear it with pride. A tent, a tabernacle, and a temple to the Lord. Okay, not that I will live in the temple, but I will be a temple to the Lord. Well, what's a temple? It's like a place that honors and the existence of, reminds us of the existence of something. You can be a temple where people see you and they think, oh yeah, goodness and truth. Oh yeah, love and goodness. Right, there is that in the world. That's pretty cool. The shouts of joy, the singing, and the melody are the qualities of a heavenly mindset affecting how we live our lives. Living that way is the most powerful way of praising God. It's not just that God needs to know something. It's that we're doing what God wants, what God is trying to do, which is to remind everyone of that love and of that way of being, that this is actually the template that human beings can follow. That's how you praise God. God, let's say praise the Lord, is to be really great to people, be excellent to each other, as Bill and Ted would say. The tent expresses the idea of something heavenly, and the shouting, singing, and music making something spiritual that grows out of it. Because you think about, if you're going to shout or sing or make music, it's it's an expression of a feeling. You got the feeling inside you, and you're like, I gotta, yeah, 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 rock it up. It's this progression. Spiritual things, which are the truth and goodness involved in faith, were celebrated by harp and lute, by song, and by spiritual music, or similar, similar music. The holy or heavenly aspects of faith were celebrated by, and how specific would you like to get here? The holy or heavenly aspects of faith were celebrated by wind instruments, horns, and so on. 
This is why so many instruments were connected with the temple and why it says so many times that certain instruments were used in celebrating this thing or that. This is actually a correspondence. Just like in the Bible, all these phrases we're going through, all the words have particular spiritual meaning. Actual objects can have that too, if we're hooked in, if we understand it. That's why, why do you think so many religious ceremonies have the particulars that they do? It's because when they were first created, there was some kind of knowledge or maybe innate knowledge, maybe overt knowledge that this symbolizes a certain thing. This can connect us to a certain thing with heaven. So the instruments are taken to mean the very qualities themselves that the instruments were honoring. Okay, we know that God can protect us from everything that bothers us. And we know that we've got to go and try to get it. So let's go. This next couple of verses are about actively seeking. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Hey, remember, I'm talking. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Okay, so we've got a little bit of self-compulsion here. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You who have been my help, do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. This, in, in a nutshell, I'll put a little nutshell around this. We have to freely choose this path. And that involves seeking the Lord's help. You may feel like this is not very nice of God to be so um, not apparently present that you get feeling, hey, don't forsake me. Shouldn't God be right here all the time? I think what this is actually describing is us ardently striving. And if this feeling of a bit of separation is just us really having to put in this, I, I actually want this. Because if we're not if we're not choosing it voluntarily and willing to actually expend effort and, and, and push for it, it, we're not really opening. God's right there, but it's about us opening. So this is the seeking. Also, why are we looking for the Lord's face? Why his face in particular? Let's talk about, let's talk about the Lord's face. When ascribed to the Lord, the face symbolizes mercy or compassion. How would you like that? Your face is compassion. The face, like, if you say somebody is the face of the organization, and that they, that means they represent the organization. So what's the face of the Lord? Mercy and compassion. If you wanted a summary of what's the Lord, it's that. It's, I, I, I know where you are, and I'm going to help you. That's God. That's not so bad. I can get into that. So not seeing his face means no mercy or no compassion. No compassion. So if you don't see it, you don't get the compassion? Wait, does the Lord only show mercy to people who happen to find his face and he doesn't care about the rest of us? Not that the Lord lacks compassion. After all, he is mercy itself. Phew. But when we have, so why is there any tension here? If God is mercy and, mercy and compassion itself, why, why is there anything but that? But when we have no middle ground to create a bond, oh, that's what you need, a bond. The Lord's got the compassion and the mercy, but what we need is a bond. And to get to that, and we need to be able to join, and to get to that, we need this middle ground. It seems to us as though there is no compassion in the Lord because it's right there, but you're not feeling it. It's like uh, when you are, I think, when you're diabetic or there's a, a, a insulin problem where you can have tons of sugar in your bloodstream, but it can't get to the cells. There's all kinds of situations where it's, it's right there. We just can't distribute it. This is because we do not, why, why? What conditions would lead us to not being able to have something that lets us bond to God? What could get in the way with that? This is because we do not welcome goodness if we have uni no uniting middle ground. It's about us. It's about us welcoming. We have to say, "Come on in." Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Right? If anyone opens it up, Jehovah or the Lord's face means divine love itself. 
And since it means divine love, it means mercy, because mercy springs from love for the human race. That's God, which is cons consigned to so much misery. Ah, oh, that's us. <laughs> it's so, if you love the human race, you, your heartstrings are tugged, because we're in a bit of a mess here. And that is God's number one project all the time, is to reach out to the human race and try to get us to untangle ourselves, to be willing to be untangled, I should really say. So love is our life. What's the Lord's life? It's love for the human race, which takes the form of mercy because right now we need help. Jehovah or the Lord's face means mercy. Also peace and goodness, since these are qualities of mercy, not bad perks to have mercy, since Je seeing, seeking Jehovah's face stands for seeking his mercy. Do not hide your face. When we're saying, don't hide your face to God, it means help me out of false ideas and harmful feelings that block my awareness of you. That's what's in the way. What can hide the Lord's face? Not good. It's not just, oh, he's around the corner. The only thing that can hide the face of the Lord, hide the mercy, hide the reality that God has got all this and God is going to take care of us, is false ideas. Things that aren't true, things that we believe that aren't true, and harmful feelings. So things that, so either it's we, we our understanding that God is here is blocked off, or that we are grabbed onto something that's the opposite of love for the human race. And that's making it so we don't have this common ground with which to bond with God. Seeing the Lord's face does not mean seeing his face, but knowing and acknowledging him as he is in respect to his divine attributes. This is a literal meaning, but it's not, you just, it's not like, okay, if I can just look around, get part the clouds and just see the face of God. You just that phrase, see the face of God, you know it means something deeper and more spiritual. Knowing and acknowledging him. I see. Now I see. The Lord is my light. I understand you. I see you. Acknowledging him as he is in respect to his divine attributes, of which there are many, and that people can join with him by love, know him, and in that way see his face. So if you say, uh, uh, look, seems like armies are around me, but I know God is here, and God can always protect me from hell. That's a little bit of seeing the face. God wants to, and God will unfailingly protect me from this evil and falsity. The servant is the outer self, which is supposed to serve or be of service to our inner self and the Lord. There's a part of us that's not supposed to be running the show. It's supposed to be part of the team, but it often, it, our sort of outer ego self wants to direct things, but that the it, outer self is not the light. God is the light, so we've got to get ourselves in that order. Do not turn away. Do not cast me off. Do not forsake me. All these exhortations in the psalm. Times when our outer self loses awareness of a heavenly perspective and the Lord's presence. Hey, by the way, don't feel bad. If you keep going up and down and you feel like, hey, man, I, I was up here and spiritual stuff and I was watching a video and it was all good, but now I'm back down and I don't really believe if there's any God that exists, although it seemed like there was one here. The outer self loses awareness of a heavenly perspective. It's just what it does. Take it easy. We have outer self, but it's about trying to get the outer self into this mode where even when we're out, when we're in, out of this heavenly perspective that we know, it's going to come back. And I'm, I'm not running the show. I'm just keeping it warm until that heavenly perspective comes back in. Not easy to develop, but you can make little incremental progress. It's part of a, the journey of spiritual growth that we sometimes feel disconnected. That doesn't mean that the Lord is gone. Good comes out of these ups and downs if we keep feeding our desire to connect with God in heaven. It's just the seasons. It's just the day cycle. It'll get warm again. It'll get bright again. It's important to keep seeking, which will help clear away false perspectives that block our view. This being all a synthesis of what Swedenborg has to say about this stuff. Yeah, let's see if we can't move this stuff that's in the way. Verses 10 to 12, we're getting towards our conclusion here, and we're talking about reconnecting. And suddenly, why do you got to bring my mom and dad into this and, t and tell me that they might leave me, abandon me? What, what place does that have in this psalm? If my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Very mysterious. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Oh, the enemies are back. Mom and dad ditched me. The enemies are back. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, or for false witnesses have risen against me, and they are breathing out violence. What an image. Okay, we got to talk about 
our parental unit. If my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. This is in Secrets of Heaven. Is this about your literal mom and dad? Just like it's not about literal armies, there's something universal in this. Goodness is like a father, and truth like a mother. Oh, so it's just like the adversaries were stuff in us, the false and evil things in us. The father and mother are things in us as well. So on an inner level of the word, this is because the, sorry, I just have to pause for a second. The psalm is not talking to you, it's talking about you and all the things inside of you. This is the way the psalm can be applied to everyone. Because if it was just talking to you about you and then there's your adversaries out there, well, what if that one of your adversaries reads the psalm? Is it talking, you know, is it, is it about, still about you? This is something that can travel anywhere. It's talking about the good stuff in you and the bad stuff in you. It's talking about how there's like a father and mother in you. And you can read it and use it. Your mom and dad can read it and use it. People you feel like are your adversaries can read it and use it. In each of those cases, it's God's mercy reaching out to that individual about what's going on with them. That's the universal correspondential paradigm. So on an inner level of the word, a father symbolizes goodness and a mother truth. In fact, they symbolize the goodness and truth from which come lower or secondary forms of goodness and truth. And these are like their daughters and sons. Father and mother stand for goodness and truth, which are said to desert us when we realize we cannot do anything good or know anything good on our own. A fascinating, almost feels like a detour, but it's saying, if my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. The feel of that is, yeah, I'm, you are suddenly taking this role. Or when we're little, you have, you know, parents that are there and they're for you. I guess I should have drawn them bigger. But even if they were gone, or even if they left you, they said, I'm, I'm done. The Lord could provide that same kind of closeness and that same kind of intimacy and total protection as your mom and dad. But what Swedenborg is saying is that there's there's a part of this where you need to be forsaken by, because you sort of have, you have this goodness and truth that you recognize in you, right? And it feels like this is, this is yours, but there's a moment when you realize, wow, even this is God's, because it disappears at times, where you feel like I, I have no resources left, and that's when God reaches down and and, and takes on that kind of nurturing, caring role, and you realize, oh wow, even that, even that is God. We realize we cannot do anything good or know, or know anything good on our, our, on our own. So it's when we come to understand that e even the stuff that feels like ours that's good is the Lord's, which is great because this is what allows us to have this middle ground to make this partnership. What comes out of a downtime of feeling disconnected is a realization of how much we need the Lord as a source of truth and goodness because we can't come up with that on our own. That realization makes us more open to the Lord's help. You gotta live it. You gotta hit that bottom a bit or, or you can never get this exciting opportunity to actually seek the refuge that the Lord is offering. When it's talking about teach me your way is that we're more willing to be taught after we've been through something like this, a level path it's learning how to live the good life. Again, all the bad actors, the false witnesses, the enemies, the adversaries, is we have greater awareness of these false ideas and harmful impulses that want to lead us astray. When we're starting to be able to recognize, not nah, last time you said I needed to get all bunched up about this and go pursue this, and when I did, it didn't turn out well. I'm starting to have a little bit of insight into that you might not be that helpful. Finally, Verses 13 and 14 teach us that uniting with the Lord is spiritual life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. God is trying to bring us to life. Nobody doesn't want that. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Where is that? Just the sound. Who doesn't want to be in the land of the living. You know, there's like the night of the living, the, the night of the living dead or something. It's like, oh, I'm dead, but the land of the living. Nobody doesn't want to be there. 
the land of the living, heaven and the heavenly state of mind. This is where God's life is, that goodness and love we talked about before. In no way is it possible for more than a single life force to exist from which all other beings receive life. Okay. So, it seems like, well, we, you know, there's just so many little things here. There's you, and there's um, a red panda, and there is a blue whale, and there's lichen, and there's all, and then there's your neighbor, and there's people that you don't know that live on other continents, right? There's so much different kinds of life. No, there are a bunch of life receivers, and there's only one life that moves through them all, which is God. Any life that is truly to be life must come by way of faith in the Lord, who is life. And any faith that is to have life within it must come from him, and therefore must have him within it. Yes, I did draw the Lord as a giant octopus here, but hopefully it's a good representation of this outreach of, of real life that can come to us. For this reason, the word describes the Lord as the only living being. It calls heaven, which lives from him, the land of the living. Wait for the Lord is to let the Lord teach us true ideas and unite them with good intentions and good actions. Let the Lord teach. I like that, that this picture here of, what, okay, we're waiting. That there's, of course you have to go out and be active in your life, but there's this element of I'm doing stuff, but what I'm really waiting for as I work on this project, as I try to do these things is the Lord is going to actually be the one moving this forward. So how, where is the Lord? This happens as we do our best to walk the journey of spiritual growth. The Lord is giving us spiritual life and protection by building heaven inside of us. So all that we were talking about at the beginning. How do we get to the place where we have a stronghold? Yeah, it's worth the giant scroll of a lifetime. These things. How do we get where we're in light, where we have salvation, where we're in a stronghold? How do we get to that state where we're protected and we can see everything and we're, we're moving through our life unafraid? It's allowing the Lord to build heaven inside of us. We do that by seeking the Lord, and seeking that loving goodness that is the core of who the Lord is, and trying to make that what we do. The protection is there. The guidance is there. We just got to vote with our feet, walk over in the way of the Lord. So that's the meaning of the psalm. What does it do for you? Let us know in the comments. Hopefully this breakdown allows you to get a little more clear on this divine reality and go and pursue it and, and see that face of the Lord uh, everywhere you go. Thanks for hanging out.